Um, today I want to welcome our guest speaker, who is Alex Singleton from the Department of Geography and Planning at Liverpool University. Um, he started in Liverpool in, in 2010, uh, has very quickly progressed up to Reader in 2014. Um, uh, Alex and I share a supervisor. Our supervisor was Paul Longley, who used to teach here ooh, 20 years ago. So we do have, he does have a sort of link, tenuous link to, to the school. Uh, and also Mike Batty was his second supervisor, who's a visiting fellow in the school and used to teach here as well. Um, Alex did his PhD on educational opportunities and early widening participation using UFAS data and geodemographics. And his work on ge geodemographics has evolved. Um, and today he's going to talk through some of his more recent research in ge geodemographics, uh, investigating the internal structures of cities. So I'll pass you over to, to Alex, and um, hopefully we'll have a really interesting talk. OK, thank you, Scott. Um, so, um, cities are very complicated places. Um, estimated 7 billion people live within, uh, 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 sorry, uh, uh, are within the globe. Around 53% uh, of these people live within urban areas. Um, it's tipped over 50% uh, a few years ago, uh, and that's a growth uh, trend that's going to continue. So, lots of different types of people live within cities uh, and in, live within different types of urban environments. So, you know, you, if you imagine the sort of life that people who live in these different types of housing within the UK have, uh, their life chances, opportunities, their behaviours are all probably quite different. So, we've got Victorian terraces, different types of people will typically live there than sort of very large detached homes out in the countryside. I think that's actually the Haygate Estates uh, on Elephant and Castle, which I think has been knocked down recently. So, um, <coughs> process of gentrification changing sort of the structure of cities. And how we understand this complex geography is really what geodemographics are about. It's about looking at the sort of characteristics of people uh, and the places that they, uh, uh, they inhabit. So, uh, thinking back to some of those pictures of, of different types of residential structures um, and then how they map onto potential behaviours, um, the types of people who might do all their shopping in a local shop could be very different from those who might shop uh, at a supermarket. Uh, if you ended up in hospital for a particular reason, uh, the type of people who might end up at hospital uh, because they had a sports injury for skiing, again, they're probably going to live in quite different places, perhaps with people who've had very poor diets and have had uh, sort of uh, cardiovascular problems, have had heart problems and have gone off uh, in an ambulance to the local hospital uh, for those reasons. Um, similarly, I'm more likely to go to uh, Blackpool as a university uh, academic uh, than Barbados. Um, and again, these kind of different uh, behaviours, people who finish their education at school uh, or perhaps go on to university. So, as I say, geodemographics are really how we unpick these different sort of behavioural geographies um, based on um, uh, uh, location uh, as a surrogate for knowing about um, the individual char uh, characteristics of individuals uh, and what their likely behaviours are going to be. There's just four sort of areas which aren't necessarily random. This is Liverpool, if you don't know the geography of Liverpool, and I'll explain what those areas are in a minute. We'll come back to that. So, one way in which people understand um, sort of the built structures uh, of places is of cartography. So, we, this is OpenStreetMap. You can digitise roads, buildings. Uh, you can collect together lots of information about the structure of places, uh, and it's, uh, it's collated on a map, uh, sort of a cartographic representation. So that tells you a little bit about how places are organised in terms of what is where. Um, who is where? Um, the traditional uh, method of doing that uh, is, is to do a, a national census. Every sort of 10 years you get a form, you fill it in, and there's lots of questions about the characteristics uh, of your household and your family structure and what you do and, and where you go to work and so on. And those are collated at the area level. And you can tell a lot about places um, uh, from looking uh, at the attributes of these, these maps. So this is um, something from a piece of work I did um, to develop some census atlases for England and Wales, looking at every local authority district, uh, mapping all the attributes uh, from the census that were available publicly at the time of release um, as a small area geography. So there's one of these maps for every local authority uh, in England and Wales. Uh, that's just, for example, again, is, is the Liverpool example on the, uh, on the left. Um, no, your, your left, sorry. Uh, it's where the student populations live, so there are people typically aged sort of 20 to 24, so that's around the universities and where the sort of student accommodation is. 
Uh, and then the other map are, are people who are sort of married and, and have families, so they're the more residential areas. Um, different types of people living in different types of places uh, correlate to different types of housing requirements. Um, so you, you tend to find that uh, form uh, follows the types of people who, who typically live within those areas. And obviously areas change over time. But there's obviously lots and lots and lots of attributes in the census. Um, I, I calculated, because I've done two releases of this atlas, and um, the first time it was released, it, it was quite popular, and it, it got into the Guardian, um, which was a, a sort of serendipitous um, uh, sort of event. A colleague of mine happened to be sat next to the man who edits the Guardian data blog at the time I tweeted it and showed it him, and that's how it happened. So it's, but anyway, it got picked up, and they were asked, how, you know, how many maps are there? I had no idea, because I hadn't counted them. So the second time around, I counted them, and it was 134,000. 567 individual maps. Uh, so I did a bit of sort of rough arithmetic, sort of a, a sort of a, a you know a, a daily rate of sort of pay for a GIS technician, possibly the world's most boring job to map every single attribute in the census for every local authority, and came up with about 140,000 pounds in seven years. So you just get it done, I think, working 24 hours a day um, for that value uh, if you were doing it individually. But again, you'd, you'd probably have been very bored by the end of that. So. That's one way you can do it. You can map attributes. Um, and it's not just the census now. We've got lots of other types of data as well. So um, when you go into hospital, uh, there's hospital episode statistics. So you know what, uh, what, what particular treatment you're having, uh, what was the sort of outcomes of those. GPs, you collect data um, when you sort of register and, and visit a GP. Uh, going back to sort of my early research, uh, when you apply to university through UCAS, um, um, which applications you made, ha what the outcomes were in terms of offers, uh, whether you accepted offers, um, um, uh, and what the attributes of you, uh, as you as a student were, you know, what, what's your parental occupation, where do you live, how old are you, and so on. Those are all collected by UCAS when you go to university. They have a census every year. He's the data collect uh, data to allocate funds on who's actually in the university. Police, so where... <coughs> where crimes happened, um, you can get data through police.uk, uh, and I think you can actually get outcome data through that as well now. So linking to crimes, what was the interventions uh, and what were the outcomes in terms of legal proceedings. Schools data, when you enter school, uh, every pupil in the country is tracked um, in, in the state school at least uh, in England with, a, with an individual ID. Uh, and you can track educational history through school, so from primary school through secondary school into tertiary education A-levels. And actually, they've linked some of these data sets together now. So you can actually look at trajectories from school into higher education. Um, there's lots of data generated in retails. So whenever I go into the shop, use my sort of Tesco card or, or my Nectar card. Um, uh, th those uh, purchases are recorded against me <coughs> as an individual. And again, they can be used uh, for different types of segmentation. Transportation, again, uh, is generating lots of data. So in London, we're using Oyster cards on the tube system, uh, touches in and touches out, or it could be a uh, bike share scheme, so where you're using bikes um, uh, within, within the city. Property, again, is another attribute that you can get a lot of data on. So uh, we can get sort of land registry data on sales prices. Um, banking, again, similar to retail. Uh, these, these two data sets, uh, and the telecoms as well, uh, are, are sort of more sort of uh, private domain. But again, there's lots and lots of data. Um, and this is actually an early, an early quote from uh, Richard Weber, who I'll introduce some, some of his early research a little bit later on. Richard was really instrumental uh, in developing the technique of geodemographics in the UK. It, it, geodemographics has got an interesting, uh, an interesting history in the sense of um, it was sort of developed in parallel in the UK to the US. In the UK, it had a very public spin. Um, which then emerged into sort of a commercial applications, whereas in the US it straight away went into sort of commercial applications. So Richard was in the UK working for something called the Environment Institute, I think it was the Environment Institute uh, in London, um, and he, as part of that work he was doing some analysis, which I'll, I'll show you a little bit later on, but he, his view on, on this and some of the early examples of what could be broadly termed geodemographics is you're trying to, from all these different attributes about places, pick out patterns from the detail without losing too much information uh, from, from the original data that you had. So it's about saying from all these attributes, what are the key characteristics that define a place? Places are multidimensional. They're not just single attributes from these different, uh, different data sets. Back in the 1970s, he was only talking about census data, incidentally. 
So anyway, I told you I'd come back to those. Those different, um, we were going to play a guessing game, but obviously because I've had to swap to uh, a PDF, it doesn't work. But anyway, uh, the Beatles' homes. So you've got um, uh, the four Beatles, uh, and that's where their homes were in Liverpool. Uh, and I've coded them up by their sort of present-day geodemographic classification. So we've got three Beatles here living in um, urban adversity, and they're actually quite deprived neighbourhoods. Uh, you might have guessed this anyway, because there's quite a lot of crowds out on the streets of what appear to be derelict houses, which is not normal behaviour within cities. Um, John Lennon, the, um, the working class hero, is the only one who lived in um, affluent uh, uh, achievers. And this is, a, this is a modern day geodemographic classification, so it's not really relevant to when they, they live there. And this is what geodemographics do. They look at all these different attributes about places and they create um, a sort of a, 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 an aggregate measure, if you like, of the type uh, of characteristics. And it's a, the characteristics of both the built structure of the areas, is it flats, uh, is it sort of detached, semi-detached houses, and also the types of people who live there, which could be ethnicity and age profiles. And in terms of commercial classifications, things like income as well is very important. Um, but actually, geodemographics in the broadest sense got, has got quite a long history. And this is probably the most famous example. Um, when I arrived at uh, the University of Liverpool, I actually found out we had a Booth's chair, which I thought was very exciting because it had the same name as Charles Booth. And it turned out it was, in fact, the Charles Booth chair it's in sociology. Um, he was a, a Liverpudlian, and at some point obviously gave some money to the university to establish this name chair. Um, Charles Booth uh, was a shipping business owner, uh, very, very wealthy, and then became a philanthropist. Uh, and he's best known for maps you've probably seen. Um, uh, these maps here, which are basically a very large survey he did in sort of the 1880s. Uh, of London uh, and what that involves was a lot of primary observations so this previous slide here um, are some very detailed notebooks and actually all on the LSE's website uh, about what he saw when him and his survey team were walking around these particular areas this is actually a walk with a police constable because some of these areas were actually not particularly nice and he was obviously a bit fearful for his life so um, there's all this sort of primary data that he gathered and essentially what he did in terms of creating this sort of geodemographic uh, was colour in buildings by this different, uh, this different classification um, uh, that, he, that he sort of came up with. So the black uh, colour and the dark blue would go from vicious semi-criminals. Um, again, the, uh, the labelling is quite aggressive, and I'm not sure that in some of the commercial classifications it's got a lot better, to be honest. We haven't really learned much, but uh, dark blue, very poor, chronic wants and so on, through to yellow, sort of upper, upper middle class. And I think... Yeah, this is the centre of London, uh, centre of London somewhere. So that's a, an example of an early geodemographic classification. The data wasn't census data at this stage. It was, it was data just collected, um, uh, collected uh, uh, by, by, uh, by Booth and his, his research team. Um, I always put this on because I actually did an undergraduate degree at Manchester uh, and I sort of always like to promote the city. But at the same time, uh, someone called Thomas Marr um, who was a housing reformist uh, and published this report on, on, on sort of housing in Manchester in 1904, was doing a similar survey. And you can actually, I think there's some free PDFs of this online, it's well worth a look. You've got fantastic photographs um, of some of these old back-to-back -back houses which are sort of described as slums. Um, he was interested in housing reform, so he was proposing sort of new types of buildings which could replace some of these old houses. Uh, again, another Liverpudlian connection is this is uh, Port, Port Sunlight, um, which is over on the Wirral. Um, uh, uh, um, and the, these were the homes that they were sort of planning uh, in Manchester to replace uh, some of the houses that were, were, were deemed not uh, fit for purpose. And he developed a similar thing to Charles, Charles Booth, and this is a very nice uh, uh, map of Manchester. Uh, you can actually, this one, if you go to manchester.publicprofiler.org, um, there's actually this map's online, uh, and you can look at it in context of current day geodemographics. And what you find is actually when you look at these old classifications of different types of residential structures, so we've got, uh, these are back-to-back -back houses through to sort of suburban houses, warehouses and so on. Some of those functions uh, and forms of the property um, in sort of 1904 actually follow through to the types of areas that uh, uh, form in the, the modern day clusters. So <coughs> um, a very obvious one would be a lot of the offices and warehouses uh, chopped up into sort of city centre flats. So the actual locations remain the same, although the types of people who are living there are obviously quite different and the functions of the areas are quite different. That's Thomas Marr. Um, a little bit later on, um, uh, there was a, a whole um, series of analysis uh, called social area analysis, 
developed in the 1950s by Chef Kim Bell uh, in, in the context of San Francisco. Um, they've done some, uh, Chef Kim had done some slightly earlier work um, in the, uh, probably about two or three years earlier, uh, about 1951, I think it was, with, Chef, uh, uh, with Williams, Chef Kim Williams on LA. And this was kind of um, a revisiting of that uh, to try and create some more um, uh, formal framework for the analysis that they had done. And this is really sort of the heart of the first um, uh, type of geodemographics. It's a different technique methodologically, but they were starting to use data to, uh, to actually create um, labels for particular areas. These are the attributes that they fed in. Essentially, they, they had a series of domains, urbanization, segregation, and social rank. They collated a load of uh, census, <coughs> they collated a series of um, census variables for those particular domains. And then they had a technique, um, social area analysis. It was kind of a factor analysis uh, to create this sort of multi-dimensional typology of places. So this is San Francisco, uh, and this is sort of Berkeley and Oakland over this side of the water. Um, their mapping works on um, urbanization sort of high to low, social rank high to low, and then uh, census tracts with high indices of segregation. I've got a little point on here. It's a really nice piece of cartography, and it's actually a very nice uh, a book to read. You can buy the uh, original uh, sort of text for a few pounds on Amazon uh, Marketplace. It's not very expensive. I presume they printed a lot of them. Um, and this is where Richard Weber comes in. So that was in the US. That was happening in the US in sort of the 1950s. And this same, uh, this same technique uh, built momentum. And uh, it continued to build momentum until the 80s before it sort of was usurped by um, modern day geodemographics. Um, so Richard Weber. Uh, when he was working in London, did this, uh, what they call inner area study in Liverpool, and it's applying the social area analysis uh, sort of techniques in the context of Liverpool. And this is actually all about uh, looking for where you could target uh, deprivation alleviation funding. So you would use this in much the same way as you would a sort of common, uh, a common day index of multiple deprivation. And this is what it looked like. Um, and it's a, if you go through the report, it's a very similar methodology as they applied in the US. Uh, they were using 1971 census data. Um, they had to do some quite innovative things, like they had to pre-cluster the areas into larger areas because they didn't have a computer powerful enough to process uh, the number of areas that they had within, within Liverpool. Uh, and they collapsed these attributes using something called principal components analysis. So you're looking for uncorrelated components. So one component might be ethnicity, one might be sort of correlated with affluence and so on. So, they used these to build these sort of area typologies. And this, this is uh, the, the map that they sort of produced. They started to produce things which we now refer to as pen portraits, which are, they looked at the areas that are assigned to each of these sort of clusters that they created. Uh, and they, they wrote uh, sort of um, not quite sort of uh, lucid descriptions and some photographs of the types of properties within those zones. So uh, these are sort of um, fairly middle class areas, um, semi-detached uh, sort of the south of Liverpool, this is described as sort of the most affluent cluster, and there's lots of sort of detached homes. And incidentally, that would have been where John Lennon's home was, so he is affluent, even by a classification more relevant to when he used to live there. And the obvious extension to doing it for Liverpool is to expand it nationally, and that's really the birth of geodemographics. Um, so this, uh, they, they couldn't, again, do it at a more disaggregate geography because they didn't have the computers with enough sort of power to be able to process the data. Um, so it was a bit more aggregate. It started off at parliamentary uh, constituencies. <coughs> Over time, the, the funding streams for this kind of like public sector research uh, dried up. Um, Richard Weber went to work uh, for the commercial sector in the, in the 1980s uh, and developed uh, the ACORN classification, or what became the ACORN classification with CACI, and then later um, he parted ways with CACI and he went to work for Experian and developed the Mosaic classification. And they're the two, globally, the sort of two biggest classifications, uh, which Richard's, I mean, the, 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 the Mosaic classification, Richard's been involved in the current one, so he's still uh, quite active uh, in, in this area. So going on to what a modern day geodemographic looks like, um, <clears throat> as I said, they, these tools were sort of commercialized in the 80s because. Um, they're very useful for finding out, you know, which areas are deprived and which areas aren't deprived vis-a-vis um, uh, uh, -vis different contexts, but they're also very useful for selling products. So in the 1980s, um, sort of, uh, junk mail marketing was huge. So, you know, if you get Saga Holidays brochures through your door, the reason is you either live in an area where people who typically would be old enough to get sort of uh, go on Saga Holidays live, or you are of that age yourself. Um, 
And that's really, they know that because they profile you by one of these geodemographics. So that was the principal applications, but they're actually used in lots of different contexts. More recently, uh, the public sector sort of, um, sort of had a new interest, uh, a sort of a renaissance, as uh, Paul Longley describes it, uh, in using geodemographics for lots of applications re related to uh, the public sector, operation of the public sector, uh, be that service delivery or, or targeting of resources. So as I say, my, as Scott mentioned, my PhD was about um, higher education and access to higher education, but it was through the lens of um, um, geodemographics uh, 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 use in higher education. So this is um, what a modern day uh, geodemographic looks like. This is um, Mosaic from Experian. They do it at postcode level uh, and they divide all of the country up into 15 groups which um, nest uh, 66 types. So 66 is the finer level classification. Uh, 15 groups is a bit more aggregate. That's the aggregate, <coughs> aggregate classification. 450 input variables. So it's drawn from more than just a census. Uh, and this is the hierarchy that they have. And what they do is they provide quite nice sort of descriptive labels uh, 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 at both the type and the group level uh, for this classification. Uh, they also provide um, descriptive uh, portraits uh, like this. So uh, there's actually a written description of what the, what the characteristics of this group are, but they, they provide some graphs. Um, they usually give you sort of a montage photograph to give you an idea of the types of people who might live in here. So this group's called City Prosperity and they're all very affluent living in sort of large houses versus people who are perhaps a bit lower income, family basics, and again, listening to different types of houses, different types of um, age structure, uh, income and so on. Uh, different types of channel preferences. So this is, as I say, the commercial, the commercial spin. It's um, uh, the, the way in which you might reach out to these people if you're marketing to them. Uh, and they have other stuff as well, sort of graphs and so on. So that's really, I suppose, the, the sort of the, the background, if you like. Uh, and then I thought what might be quite useful is to talk through some of the challenges, I think, because geodemographics is also a research area, which is, is really uh, uh, where, where, where my work sort of comes in. Uh, so I, I've been interested in, say, four, four things to date, and then I'll sort of talk a bit about what I'm doing, um, what I'm doing next uh, in terms of uh, my future research. Um, openness, transparency, um, giving people a voice to provide feedback about classifications where they think they've got them wrong. Uh, classifications being responsive to population change uh, and, universal, and universality, which is essentially, are, is there a sort of one-size-fits-all geodemographic model, which is what traditionally has been sold by commercial geodemographics providers. But, I mean, that's, that has evolved over time as well. So, how can you make classifications more open? Um, this is a problem because if you're, um, if, you're using these, if you're using these for research, you've got issues about reproducibility. You've got to be able to show that you can reproduce these tools that you're using. If you're in the public sector uh, and, and you're using uh, a commercial classification for targeting, someone perhaps doesn't get access to a particular service because you, you've targeted it in a certain way, and they challenge that, um, and they challenge the segmentation that you used. If you don't know how the classification was built, then it's very, very difficult for you actually to justify your targeting decisions. There's an ethical dilemma there. Now, over time, commercial companies have got better at this, and there's, there's usually some methodological detail uh, available about how classifications were built, but it's certainly not rich enough that you could reconstruct or uh, recompile a classification so you could examine any kind of biases. It's also often difficult to reproduce classifications because of um, um, these, these issues here as well. You don't know the methods I mentioned, but also a lot of the data is privately owned. Uh, and you don't know any kind of bias, which is sort of inherent within the data that they're using for those particular type, uh, typology tools. Um, so that's the problem, and that's really the sort of driver for having open geodemographics. Now, the first stab at this uh, was in 2001, um, uh, but more recently uh, revisited in 2011. Uh, in a project that I was involved in with the Office for National Statistics. Um, this is, uh, has been gone for the past couple of years. It started just as I left UCL. So the, the, it was a PhD researcher called uh, Chris, De uh, Chris Gale, and I was one of his supervisors uh, have developed this. Um, and this, I say, this extends something called the uh, output area classification, which was, was built for the first time in 2001. Uh, and the idea is that it uses purely census variables uh, and it's a, it's a methodology called cluster analysis, which looks at the characteristics of 
lots of different census variables about an area and forms these groups of areas with shared characteristics. I don't want to go too much into the methodology, but the, the framework for the classification is sort of three domains of uh, demography, housing, and socioeconomic status. And then there's a series of subdomains. Um, so in demographic, you've got age structure, family structure, ethnicity, and so on and so on. And then you've got the measures, the variables, which actually are the attributes from the census. And you form these frameworks as your sort of theoretical framework for why you've built a classification in a certain way. And this very much links back to the sort of work that Shevke and, uh, uh, and Bell were doing in the 1950s with their framework. They came up for social area analysis of San Francisco. So this is what it looks like after you've done this cluster analysis. And again, I've just highlighted, <coughs> um, I've highlighted Liverpool, but I'll show you um, a, a map of Cardiff in a second as well. Most of the uh, country is green, which falls into this uh, rural residence group. And then you can see here, this is, this is the centre, this is uh, Liverpool. Uh, there's actually none of those rural groups in Liverpool at all. It's entirely urban, according to the output area classification, which is, is fairly accurate. Um, you've got um, central areas represented by these cosmopolitans. Um, you've got these um, suburbanites in some of the more suburban areas and so on and so on. So um, this is actually a new um, website. This is very, very beta. It's not actually online yet, but we have a version of this online. Uh, this is my, my new grant, Consumer Data Research Centre, which is actually looking at providing uh, universe, um, academic access to some of these retailer data sets that I mentioned earlier, which are currently not accessible. Um, so we've, we've got a public portal to some of this. At the moment, we've just got geodemographic classifications on there. So this is uh, the output area classification for, for Cardiff. We've got the Cosmopolitan Group. I think the university's around here. My geography of Cardiff is not great. Uh, and then you've got um, at some areas with sort of greater ethnic diversity here, um, some an area described as hard press, so perhaps a bit more deprived on the periphery and so on. Other types of descriptive materials that you get with this classification, they're not quite as jazzy as the commercial outputs. So uh, the classic one that they use is a radial plot. This is two radial plots for uh, rural residents and one called constrained um, city dwellers, two different clusters. Um, and the, the names are assigned by looking at plots like this uh, and looking for these big peaks and these big dips uh, in the attributes. So this is rural residents and you've got basically um, uh, low persons per hectare, low density. Uh, households who sort of live in detached houses or bungalows, which would be more prevalent in rural areas. And obviously you, you map it and look where these clusters form as well. Constrained city dwellers, um, more, percent, more households privately renting, more households living in flats. Um, like uh, the commercial classifications, uh, these have all got descriptions. So these are two of the, the subgroups of the classification. Uh, and again, the, 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 the descriptions are designed just to pick out some of the key attributes. And I did a couple of postcodes uh, just as illustrative, uh, which was sort of near, near Cardiff. And you can see that the two clusters come out quite differently. This one's near the university. This one's more on the periphery. Um, all, and the, the openness comes from all of the data. Um, the methodology is currently going through peer review, uh, like the previous uh, Alpateri classification did. Um, all of the code used to create the classification, we wrote the whole thing in R. Uh, all the maps, all the descriptions, uh, all the data tables, everything from the reports uh, in quite a high level of detail is all available to download publicly uh, and critique or, or use, which I think is quite important. You could replicate it in different contexts or, or adapt it for different applications. But there's nothing at all closed about the classification. The data is accessible to everyone, the methods accessible to anyone, and anybody can use it if they can you know, sort of use the code. Uh, uh, for their own particular purposes. And this makes it completely reproducible. So you might not like the outputs, but you will know how the outputs uh, were created. You might uh, disagree with the variables. Well, that's fine. You can have a disagreement about the variables that went into it, but you can also change it and adapt it to what you think it should be. And that's the kind of purpose of having open geodemographics. The thing that's slightly different is the commercial classifications, when you buy them, you buy subscriptions to these classifications and you get a lot of service uh, and help uh, around using them, so how you can apply the classification to your data. You might get a tool to be able to do that. You might get help in interpreting the output of the analysis. Now, not, we don't have any of that uh, in the context of this. The ONS don't have the sort of resources to be able to provide that kind of, uh, kind of support. So we have sort of a series of websites that people like me build uh, and people, um, uh, members of what we call the sort of uh, output area classification user group um, build just 
essentially the community provides that support. So if, for example, you had a query about output area classification, post it on here, uh, myself, Chris, or one of the other people who are sort of member of this particular group would respond and hopefully that would sort of resolve your problem. We haven't done it yet because it's still early days, but previously we developed sort of postcode coding tools and these kind of things as well. Okay, so one classification to rule them all. Is there just one picture of reality? And this was one of the problems I had when I originally started uh, using geodemographics. Um, the, the commercial companies at the time were very keen on this idea that there was this one classification, which is what reality looked like. Now, is reality eight clusters? Is it, is it nine clusters? Is it 10 clusters? And the answers to all of those, it could be whatever you want it to be. Uh, and a lot of my work actually looked at how you can um, unpick, for example, the most appropriate number of clusters to represent reality. Uh, and of course, that will adapt depending on your application. So you might find that one classification is really good for applications in education, but terrible for policing. Uh, or it's very good for sort of general purpose local authority applications, but really bad for um, sort of allocating funding to GPs. That is a problem. Um, and so a lot of my work um, a few years ago was about developing bespoke classifications. And that's really uh, what this particular example is. Um, you can build classification for particular application purposes. So I'll show you one a little bit later on about uh, use and engagement with the internet as a, as, a, as a specific example. But also this, which was, was quite recent. Um, it also, when you're talking about bespoke classifications, it can also mean uh, for a particular geographic area. So this is London. Uh, that's the 2001 output area classification. There were six groups, uh, six, sorry, six super groups nationally. Uh, and this is the uh, oak classification. I think it's, it's eight groups nationally now. Now, the problem is in London, um, most of London, as in most of the centre of London, is really in only about two groups in oak 2001 and a couple more groups in oak 2011, probably two or three groups. But it's still not very good, and that is a problem. So oak was always critiqued in, two, in the 2001 version for uh, not being particularly useful for London. So what you can do is you can redefine it. So you basically, you create the, the new extent just for London, you build a specific typology for London. Um, in this, the case of the London output area classification, again, like the census atlas, there's, a, there's an atlas uh, of all the local, author all, all local authority districts in London. Uh, you can actually get a far richer picture. So that's the, the sort of super group level, and that's the group level. And it really does provide a much better differentiation uh, of the population of London. And this is exactly the same methodology as Oak, but all that's happened is the only difference is rather than clustering the national data set, you cluster one just for London. And that what happens is when you, if you think of a cluster um, uh, as like a big ball and there's a mean at the center of that ball, those means change position slightly because London is a special case relative to the rest of the UK. But it's not that special. So I've also done this in the context of Liverpool and you do find that within a locality, as I mentioned, Liverpool doesn't have any of the rural areas. Within a locality, if you build a bespoke classification, you do get slightly different, uh, slightly different patterns. And there's actually a very interesting debate, uh, which I think is where that quote uh, that I mentioned from Richard Weber earlier on came from. There was a, an interaction by him and uh, an academic, I think then was at the University of Leeds, Stan Openshaw, uh, in the sort of 1980s about that 1970 classification. Uh, and there was an ar argument uh, about whether local classifications or national classifications were more appropriate for particular applications. So it's something that has stayed with geodemographics over the years. Um, and because I've got a huge amount of time, I'll just sort of whistle through this. The these are the clusters which emerge. One of the nice things you can do when you're building your own classification, uh, as I mentioned, if you imagine a cluster as a big ball of data, you can actually look at the most representative area within that ball of data. So each point in that data cloud is an area uh, with lots of attributes um, about that particular area. So this, these pictures are actually the most uh, central points in a cluster. So this, this area here is the, the, the area right at the center of a cluster, the most representative of that particular cluster. Now this is intermediate lifestyles, um, and we've got a series of characteristics here, later stages uh, in life, mostly uh, white and born in the UK, few dependent children and so on. Um, this is high density high rise flats. Again, these are more prevalently located in the centre of London. Um, and then you've got sub, the subgroups uh, within this supergroup, disadvantaged diaspora uh, and, a, and a more sort of ethnic diverse uh, Bangladeshi enclaves uh, within this particular supergroup. Um, this one's called Settled Asians. 
This is quite an interesting group. There's actually one of these clusters, uh, transport and service workers, that's almost um, universally uh, around Heathrow. And it's, it's a particular demographic of people who work at Heathrow uh, and live within the sort of locality of Heathrow. Um, uh, this is actually in Hounslow. This is near Heathrow, this particular cluster. And this is urban elites. This is very affluent. Incidentally, um, if you just sort of go around that corner, that's where CACI's head offices are. I'm not entirely sure if they sort of position their offices, or that was just serendipity, I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, they, they live around, they're just around the corner from that's in Chelsea. Um, very affluent areas in the centre of London. City Vibe, this is where you might live if you've finished university. Uh, it's got groups like graduation occupation, so if you're into your first job, you've got plenty of disposable income, you like sitting in sort of fancy coffee shops and so on, that's probably where you'll end up living. Um, quite close, mostly zone two, a little bit into zone one as well. Uh, London life cycle, uh, you've had kids, um, you want to go live in a big house and get a good school, so you probably go and live in Richmond, something like that. Um, Multi-ethnic suburbs, um, these are fairly sort of deprived suburban areas with high ethnic diversity. diversity. Uh, and these are areas which are, have got groups in sort of not quite the home counties. These are right on the periphery of London, people who quite, would quite like to live in the home counties, but perhaps live in some of these sort of cheaper areas on the periphery of London with sort of less accessible. Okay, so that's that classification. Um, um, you can build classification for different purposes. Great. Type your classification into one of our sort of profiling tools. It's wrong. <coughs> now, that can be a real problem. So it might mean that you, as I said, you get, you know, you don't get access to a particular credit card or you don't find out about some particular commercial application uh, for, uh, was targeted by junk mail. That's all okay. But what if it's, I don't know, um, breast cancer screening or something like that, you don't find out about it because they don't think you're a high-risk group. Perhaps you are a high-risk group, but you're not identified as a high-risk group because the classification's wrong. How do you feed these kind of things back? And the answer is to the commercial companies, it's very difficult. I mean, you could ring them up and you could tell them it's wrong, but I'm not sure they'd listen to you or, you know, it'd be written on a post-it note, you know, postcode X, have a look at that, please, Bob. And Bob puts that in the bin because he doesn't know what it means and so on. So. We um, uh, worked on a project a couple of years ago um, called the E-Society classification, which we've, we've just recently updated as well. Um, but also in that Open Geodemographics website where you can, you can actually type your postcode in there, we've actually built these mechanisms in there as well. So for the output area classification and the London output area classification, you can actually leave feedback. But this was the first example of what we did. And it, it was actually very interesting uh, from a sort of a, a research perspective. So we built this, this classification of the E-Society. So in the sort of early 2000s, late 90s, there was this um, common problem, uh, what they referred to as the digital divide. So people who were using the, the internet for whatever purposes, shopping or, or, or civic engagement, and people who weren't using the internet, it was a binary. Uh, people who did, people who didn't. It was actually a lot more complicated that when you looked into it. Uh, and we sort of refined this term digital differentiation using a geodemographic framework to examine um, the, more com uh, uh, the more complex use and engagement with internet and communication technologies. So some people might just use the internet for business, others might use it for social applications, some people might be using um, broadband. At the time, people might be using dial-up or it could be cable and so on. So there was, there was, lots, there was lots more to this problem than just people who do and people who don't. So we built this classification using various data sets about uh, internet use and engagement uh, and, and demographic data. Uh, and it formed a classification of eight groups and uh, 23 types. Uh, and that's what it looked like. Um, what we did is we built a profiling website. You could type a postcode in, you could click go, uh, and it would tell you a profile. And I'll show you what a couple of the profiles look like on the next slide. Um, we did a small press release uh, and uh, put it, it actually got onto the BBC News website and I think we, in the course of an afternoon, had a quarter of a million people typing their postcodes in, uh, quite a large proportion, well, I think it was a large proportion, probably, this is going back a while, but I think it was about 7,000 responses uh, uh, to, to give us some feedback of whether they thought it was right or whether they thought it was wrong and if it was wrong, what it probably should have been. Uh, and this is uh, the, the profiles that you get when you, when you type your postcode in here. As I said, these, these are actually old now, so these you can consider them the profiles that would be sort of appropriate mid-2000s. But we've actually just done a new one, which we're going to release uh, sometime after Christmas with sort of more up-to-date data. Uh, 
so th that were previous one was becoming engaged. Uh, this is e-independence people actually were highly engaged. Again, following similar sort of patterns, we sort of give a high low intensity map, showed you what type of areas were similar to the types of area that you lived in. And again, nice text descriptions here. These, th and incidentally, these descriptions are actually very good. And the reason they're very good is because Richard, Richard Weber wrote them for us, who is uh, a bit of an expert at these things. And you can do very interesting things with the data. So we, as I said, we were interested in the e-society. So this is the geography of the e-society because we mapped where the people have been searching for postcodes. And what we found is actually there was an intense cluster around the sort of tech hub in Cambridge at that particular point in time. People who, we, we presume that people would be searching postcodes of where they live, which we thought was quite interesting in itself. Um, um, the search propensity, so we actually looked at the volume of searches by different, um, by the different types. Uh, and if you imagine this, this, well, this side of the graph sort of more unengaged and this side of the graph more engaged. So that's quite a good validation in the sense of people who are, should be more engaged do search more. Um, feedback origin. So if you were lumped down in this e unengaged category, which again is logical, you might not want to be in that, particularly as you're engaged because you're on the technology section of the BBC website and you're typing your postcode into, into a website. So the feedback destination was tended to be up the other end of the chart. And it was quite, I mean, was, there were some very funny things in there when you actually picked into the data. There were people doing it in the inverse. And it was obviously, you know, someone doesn't like their neighbor. So they thought, I know what we'll do. We'll reassign them back to sort of the unengaged because they're a Luddite or whatever. So there was, there was lots of things like that in there as well. So it, it was quite an interesting data set to unpick. But, We've rolled that forward now. So the idea would be that if you pull all this uh, data together, you could potentially use it for uh, updating uh, classifications over time. Uh, and in, in some sense, that's an aspect of what I'm going to talk about now. Um, with the exception of the e-society classification, those other classifications like the output area classification are um, produced every 10 years. And actually, by the time they're produced, they're out of date because they're based on 2011 census data. And because of the release cycles, uh, and particularly when you're building a UK classification, you've got to wait for each country to get their data out uh, and the particular attributes that you need to match up between the countries. And in this case, Scotland's was very, very slow, so it delayed it further. So the, the output area classification for 2011 only came out, I think, this year. That's, that's very slow, so it's out of date. I mean, it's still useful because structure doesn't change that much, and you can actually look at that in terms of sort of 2001 uh, and 2011 geographies. And that's what this project here. So I had a ESRC grant the past couple of years uh, looking at temporal change in geodemographics. And again, this is going to be integrated into this website. It's not, it's not yet public. Um, but I actually built a classification um, which can span uh, 2001 to 2011. And it's essentially you're, you're estimating uh, the data for the intervening periods. Uh, and then the second thing it also does it looks at uncertainty. So it takes other secondary data to look at how much churn there might be in an area. So for example, within a particular output area, has there suddenly been a lot more building? Or have large houses been replaced by small houses? And there's lots of secondary data that you can gather together from some of those data sets I mentioned to actually create these kind of indicators. Um, and that's what this, this map's basically showing. So again, I can't, it's not an interactive map because it's not, it's not online at the moment. But um, you, can, you can see what, what the classification would be on the basis of these data for different time periods, um, what uh, levels of uncertainty is for those particular time periods as well. So this particular area that the mouse hovered over, it looks like in 01 it was assigned to this, then it changed and it's sort of stuck at this particular area in 2011. There was a bit more uncertainty about the estimate in 2006 and so on. Which is quite a good tool, but it does illustrate the point that things do change over time. And the census might not necessarily be the best data set to be using for these types of classifications in the future. And particularly as lots of new open data sources uh, come on stream, um, that offers uh, sort of plausible alternatives. Now, in the context of the US, um, I, I've been involved in a project uh, with a colleague of mine at um, University of Colorado, Seth Spielman, uh, to build um, uh, the first US open geodemographic classification. Now, this is, this is one of those projects which I've wanted to do for a very long time. Um, but the, one of the problems is, in the time that I've been thinking about it, the census in the US has completely changed. So the census now is only 10 questions. 
uh, and they're very basic questions, just really to give you sort of baseline demographic measures, but nothing of interest. Uh, and what it's been replaced with is um, something called the American Community Survey, uh, and that's a sort of rolling survey, which I, th I think um, they send out to around 3 million homes a year, I think, uh, on a rolling basis each month. Um, so it's not to everybody, and it's, 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 it's got a, a reasonably sort of strong sample design. And what they do with that is they conflate a series of years of data together, and they've got small area estimation models, uh, which they then generate area statistics. Um, the advantage of that is that there's a very wide variety of attributes about places that you can get through the American Community Survey. The disadvantage is that they're, for some of the variables, because they're quite specific, there's very wide margins of error. So within a census tract, your margins of error might be greater than the estimate, which is kind of useless for anything. And that becomes more intense uh, the smaller the geography that you use. So although these small area estimates uh, are released by the Census Bureau at something called um, census blocks, which again is quite a small, uh, small geography, the, 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 the confidence intervals are so wide that they're not really usable. So we settled on census tract scale. Uh, which was kind of a trade-off between having a sort of a smallish unit uh, but actually being reasonably confident about uh, the statistical properties of the estimates uh, that were available. And again, similar type of framework, uh, we selected um, sort of uh, population, environments uh, and economy, had a series of domains and a series of measures, uh, fairly typical uh, clustering. In the context of this classification, we built a sort of 250 cluster typology then hierarchical clustered that up into uh, uh, this more aggregate set of groupings here. Uh, and this is what the, the classification looks like. So this is Chicago, um, and you actually get almost a sort of concentric ring model uh, like you do with sort of the Burgess classification. If you imagine that as the coastline there, which is quite interesting. As uh, so we see here, the central area is classified into this wealthy urbanites group, and then we've got some sort of uh, uh, other groups there, Hispanic with kids is this group here. It, the, I need to change those colours. They look quite similar on this projector. They aren't Native Americans living in Chicago, or not many of them anyway. Um, and then there's, there's Manhattan as well. But we've got the whole of the US covered. I'll just whistle through this because I've not got a lot of time. But essentially, these are the profiles that we use to describe the classification. Um, they, uh, these are index scores, 100s an average, 200s double. Uh, and it, th these are the types of tools that people use to actually write the cluster descriptions and just give, give the clusters names. Uh, the classification has actually got 52 types, which we haven't yet done, uh, and it's got, t it's got 10, 10 groups. Um, for, we, we've just had a paper accepted in Annals uh, of the AAG on this particular paper. We only presented it at the, the group level because we couldn't face doing all the descriptions and names for 55 clusters, although we probably will do it for the website that we're building. So the final bit is what we're doing now. So that's really, I suppose, my project, if you like, for the past five or six years. And what I think is potentially very interesting, um, and unfortunately the ESOC didn't fund this when I put an application in recently, but I still think it's very interesting and worthwhile, and I've also discovered some more data, but not in the UK context, um, is actually looking at how, um, in addition to the attributes of places, we can actually look at interactions between places. So I started thinking about this when I, when I lived in London London's incredibly expensive to buy a house, and I lived in an awful area because I was employed by a university and didn't have very much money. Um, and I was nothing, in terms of the, my spending behaviours, my sort of uh, ethnic profile, I was nothing like the people who lived within my locality, completely different. And every day I would spend my day in Bloomsbury, which is really pleasant, uh, people who were a lot more like me, uh, and most of them went back to these neighbourhoods. Some didn't because they'd you know, lived in London a long time. Um, and that made me think about how interactions could be modelled within these geodemographic frameworks. I was far more similar to the people I uh, interacted with within the day than I was at home. And the fact that I was in that uh, home environment in an area where I wasn't similar, does that have any influence on the type of behaviours uh, and my sort of life outcomes? Uh, quite possibly. So how do you build that into um, sort of geodemographic models? And I started thinking through looking at cities in terms of um, social topology and actually looking at flows between areas through things like commuting data or schools to commuting data and how you can connect places together in addition to the attributes of the areas themselves. And that's really where I think geodemographics will go uh, uh, in, in the future. 
um, I think uh, sort of social network science and graph theory has quite a lot of potential in this particular area, which is what I was in the US last week um, looking at this particular data set, which is origin destination um, uh, of employment uh, statistics, it's called loads. And this is actually a really interesting data set for the US. It's longitudinal, which is what the L stands for, uh, and it's based on um, inland uh, IRS um, uh, uh, taxation returns. So it knows where you, your home address is, and it knows what the address is that you're, um, you're, you're working at. And they build um, a, a topological model uh, of flows for the whole of the US um, uh, at a very granular geography. It's down to blocks, I think. Uh, yes, blocks. Uh, and you, you get counts of the flows between different zones. And you can actually, from that, you can extract out for temporal periods how those flows have changed and how different areas are connected uh, to one another over time. And it's also got very interesting disaggregations uh, into population bands and also income types and job types. Um, and I think those kind of data, if we can integrate those into sort of a, a geographically weighted framework where you can look at the attributes of flows between places, the attributes of places themselves, and actually create topological models uh, which can be supplemented um, with, with uh, <coughs> can be a supplement to the standard geodemographic techniques. I think that's got a lot of potential and is a very interesting area of research. You please know that was my final slide, so <laughs> thank you very much.